Welcome, everybody. Great to have you here. Thanks for coming out on this somewhat warm night, very California October night. Uh, the new students have all been exclaiming about how it gets hot in October here? What goes on in California? So, but that's, that's the way it works in California. This is the, the hot time. And we hope, though, eventually we do get some rain. We'll see about that. I'm Henry Brady. I'm the dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the 13th annual Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Lecture in Health Policy. Uh, the Goldman School is especially honored to have this lecture every year in recognition of the late Rhoda Goldman's contribution to health care. Uh, in 1967, Rhoda Goldman co-founded the American Cancer Society's San Francisco Reach to Recovery program, uh, a program that was based upon her own experiences as a breast cancer survivor. Uh, that program continues to serve women today. And we're very happy to have Doug Goldman in the audience. Doug, raise your hand if you're here. I know he was outside. You know what? I think he's checking on the Giants game, to be really <laughs> honest. <laughs> but he will be in in a minute. He's here. Uh, but uh, and if it goes like the athletics game last night, it, it's going to be pretty depressing. Um, <laughs> But luckily, we have a great speaker tonight, so that will, will get us out of our doldrums. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce him. Uh, Dave Jones is the California Insurance Commissioner. Uh, since 2010, he has led the California Department of Insurance, the largest consumer protection agency in the state, which regulates the $123 billion insurance industry. Uh, among his many accomplishments, he has saved policymakers more than $1.6 in payments and premiums by, preventing, uh, by, by helping to regulate auto, homeowners, and other property and casualty insurance. He's also worked to make sure that at least 80% of each individual health insurance premium dollar goes to actual health care and not to administrative costs, profits, and other aspects uh, of health care that are not service delivery. Listing the awards that he has gotten over the years uh, makes him sound like a superhero. We have Top 100 Lawyers, for example, by the Daily Journal in 2011. We have Consumer Champion by the California Consumer Federation in 2008, and Leadership Award by the Western Center on Law and Poverty. So Dave Jones has had many accomplishments recognized by many different and quite diverse groups. He served in the California State Assembly from 2004 to 2010, the Sacramento City Council from 1999 to 2004, and the Clinton administration as special assistant and counsel to U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno. He began his career as a legal attorney, uh, providing league, free legal assistance to the poor. He holds degrees from Harvard Law School and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, another public policy school somewhere back east. Um, our lecture tonight will be soon available on the Goldman School's new public policy channel. Uh, this is a very exciting new venture uh, that has meant that we are going to get lots of interesting public policy events uh, up on the web through the UCTV channel, which now has a public policy channel. And I want to thank Howard Friesen, who has been helpful in helping to fund that effort. Um, this is a really exciting initiative for us because it means that speeches like this will be available on the channel for others to see. And there will also be uh, blogs and other kinds of things on that channel to keep people apprised of what's going on in the public policy arena and to keep you apprised of what the Goldman School of Public Policy is doing. So you can go to UCTV on the web and you can get there from our home page if you can't find it otherwise. Uh, we're going to have note cards tonight. They will be passed out if they haven't been already. Uh, and so you can just raise your hand during the talk if you have a note card that you want, and one of the people in the back will get you a note card. And then I will use the note cards to ask questions. Um, so without further ado, let me welcome the State Insurance Commissioner, uh, Dave Jones, who will talk about health care reform in California, challenges, and opportunities. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Are you okay with set up? Yeah, I'm very good. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a great treat to be with you here this evening, and thanks to all of you who have taken the time to turn out to allow me to share with you a little bit about what's been going on in California and nationwide with the implementation of health care reform. And it's a real privilege to deliver the Goldman School of Public Policy's annual Rhoda Goldman Distinguished Lecture in Health Policy. Now, I can tell that some of you are students uh, and that uh, several of you, at least, are MPP students. Just out of curiosity, how many MPP students in the room? All right. And undergrads? All right. And then other, other disciplines, other masters or other disciplines? Wonderful. Well, um, both my wife and I attended public policy school, so I have a very uh, uh, soft spot in my heart for masters of public policy programs and for policy schools like this one. Um, in fact, that's where I first met my wife, was in policy school. Um, even better for me, she's a Cal grad <laughs> and a native Californian. So, um, you know, I was raised outside of Chicago. I had never been west of the Rockies until I went to policy school and met the woman who uh, kindly consented to marry me. Uh, I'd never been to California, certainly. So she introduced me to California. And I came out here and I thought to myself, what is not to like about this? <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, you know, why would you not choose to live here? And so, you know, all this is to say that good things can happen to those who go to public policy school. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm the state's insurance commissioner. Probably most of you before you came into this room didn't even know you had an insurance commissioner. But what the insurance commissioner does, and there's one in every state and six territories, is regulate the insurance industry in that state or territory. And in the United States, we have a unique form of insurance regulation, unique as compared to any place else in the world. Uh, we regulate insurance state by state. And I think successfully so. In fact, if you think about the recent financial crisis, where basically it was institutions, lending institutions, regulated by federal regulators nationwide that brought the house of cards down, not insurance companies, one exception being AIG, but it wasn't the insurance side that had a problem. It was their finance side, regulated by the feds that had a problem. State by state regulation of insurance has worked really well. And in California, what we've decided to do is to make this an elected office so that I am responsible to you, the voters, not the governor, not the lieutenant governor, not the attorney general. I don't report to any of them. I report to you, I'm directly elected by you as a statewide constitutional officer. I had a department that oversees a $123 billion a year industry uh, and one that is the sixth largest insurance market in the world. Um, when you think about it, uh, insurance is important for all of us. It'd be hard to conduct our daily lives, our business, our economy without insurance. It meets a critical need. But at the same time, the insurance companies are very big, very powerful. There's disproportionate bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis them and us. And so the role of the insurance commissioner is to level the playing field to provide for a regulator to oversee those companies, make sure they're following through in the promises they make. So I thought what I'd talk about today, though, is not all of that. I've got another speech about all of that. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is the progress we've made in implementing health care reform in California and the need to enact an additional reform in California to fill a missing piece of the health care reform known as the Affordable Care Act or to others known as Obamacare. And that missing piece is the authority to reject excessive health insurance and HMO rate hikes. It's not a piece of the Affordable Care Act, and I'll explain in a little bit why it's not. But let me start with the Affordable Care Act, and I think it's important to uh, begin by recalling the impetus for the Affordable Care Act. And one of the major problems the Affordable Care Act was designed to address was that in 2009, nearly 50 million people in the United States did not have health insurance. 50 million people in one of the most advanced industrialized nations in the world. At 7 million, California had the largest number of uninsured in the United States and the seventh largest percentage of uninsured residents under the age of 65. That means that 20% or one in every five Californians did not have health insurance. And of this 7 million, 6 million were adults. Now this includes a substantial number of Californians who are gainfully employed. Uh, one in every four employed Californians was without health insurance. And health insurers were allowed to deny people health insurance if they had a pre-existing condition. So you could have had any small illness in your past and the health insurer could say, no, I'm not taking the risk. Now the 7 million Californians without health insurance had only limited options when they became ill or suffered injuries or disease. Um, certainly many could not afford the cost of paying for health care out of pocket. They delay treatment until they were very sick or their disease progressed to a point where they could no longer suffer along without care. 
the uninsured wait a long time to get care, unfortunately, and then they seek care where it's the most expensive for them and us, and that's in the emergency department. Under federal law, hospitals, emergency departments have to serve whoever presents with an emergency. But waiting until you're sick enough to be treated at a hospital means there's a lot of suffering along the way, and in some cases it's too late. And it also means that the cost of that care gets shifted to everyone else because the hospital has to pick up that cost somehow. And the way they pick up that cost is by charging more for those patients who have health insurance. So that cost gets shifted to those of us that have health insurance. And it's an expensive cost because that's the most expensive time to treat us. Probably any of you have been to an emergency room, hopefully not recently, uh, know how expensive that care can be. So it is estimated that the average insured person pays an extra $500 a year, while families are paying about $1,400 a year in additional health insurance premiums annually to pay for that cost shift just in California alone. Big impact. So the nation took a big step in addressing the problem of the uninsured and cost shifting by enacting the Affordable Care Act in 2009. Now, it's no, by no means a perfect law. Uh, we can get into greater detail as much as time permits about that issue. But one of the big missing pieces of the Affordable Care Act is the absence of any authority to reject excessive health insurance rate hikes. And that authority also doesn't exist here in California. But let's talk about the four major components of the Affordable Care Act, just to remind ourselves of what they are. First, it ends the ability of health insurers to discriminate against people who have been sick in the past or who are likely to be sick. So no longer can health insurers say no to you. Uh, this is known as guaranteed issue. They have to issue the health insurance. Your prior health condition, your future health condition, is of no moment. They have to provide the health insurance. And this is a big deal. And no longer can they have annual or lifetime caps in the health insurance they sell you, so that even where they were actually selling you the health insurance, they'd have a cap in it that would catch you up in very short order. Those are abolished also. Second big major element of the Affordable Care Act is that it requires individuals to purchase health insurance um, unless you're getting your insurance from your employer or your union, and it requires all employers with 50 or more employees to provide health insurance to their employees or pay a fine. Now, why does the Affordable Care Act mandate that health insurance be purchased by individuals or be provided by employers? Well, because now that health insurers and HMOs have to take everybody, that means they're incurring additional risk and additional cost, and you've got to spread that risk. So the import of adding everyone to the risk pool is a very, very common insurance principle. By adding more people to the pool, you spread that risk, you spread that cost. And so that's why the ACA requires that, just as we're mandated to purchase auto insurance in California. Same sort of principle. Now, the third major component of the Affordable Care Act is the establishment of new online health insurance marketplaces called exchanges, where individuals and families and small businesses can go to buy health insurance. Health insurance sold on and off the exchange has to meet certain minimum benefits and cost-sharing levels so that consumers can compare health insurance and HMO product on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. And there's a subsidy for individuals who purchase health insurance on an exchange based on your income. For example, if you make less than $45,000 a year, you get a reduced premium as an individual. There's also reduced premiums based on family size and income. So for example, a family of four that makes less than $75,000 a year gets a reduced premium also when they buy insurance on an exchange. And many who receive this premium subsidy also qualify for a subsidy to help them pay for out-of-pocket costs. There are out-of-pocket costs. You still have deductibles, you still have co-insurance, co-payments, those are capped but there's also a subsidy to help people pay for those. In California, our exchange is called Covered California, um, and it's been in operation, uh, established in 2011, uh, turned on in 2014. And the fourth major component of the Affordable Care Act nationwide here in California is allowing states to expand their Medicaid programs to cover poor single adults making up to $15,000 a year. Now, Medicaid is the state-federal partnership that provides health insurance, public health insurance, to the very, very poor. It used to be just limited to those families that had children, to seniors, and to those who were disabled. But now, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, it can be expanded to single adults. And we see these single adults in our communities across California. Um, we see others working, sometimes working as many as 35 hours per week in a job that pays minimum wage. They're still eligible. They certainly can't afford insurance on the private market. They're now eligible for Medi-Cal. So, Poor single adults are also the ones that we oftentimes see in our emergency rooms where this cost shifting is occurring. The Affordable Care Act allows states the option to expand their Medicaid programs to pick up this new cohort of poor people. So what did California decide to do? Well, you know, we're a bullish state. We decided to go all in, right? Or are we a bearish state? 
Maybe both. Maybe both. But in any event, we decided to go all in. And that is, we decided to implement every facet of the Affordable Care Act. And we had unanimity amongst most California leaders in this regard. Uh, and so we've been working very hard together. Uh, governor, the President's administration, I as the independently elected insurance commissioner covered California, departments of the governor's administration, all to put this thing together. And it's been a lot of work. We implemented all the early reforms of the Affordable Care Act from 2011 to 2014, including allowing kids to stay on their parents' health insurance till age 26. That's a big one. Um, here's one that was a good one that we implemented very early on. We ended the practice of treating women as a pre-existing condition. <laughs> that was a good one, right? What am I referring to? Ending what was euphemistically called gender rating. That is charging women more than men for basically the same stuff. In fact, in California, we got to that a bit earlier. I carried legislation as the health committee chair that ended gender rating in California in 2008. And that got picked up into the Affordable Care Act. Now it's the national standard. We implemented that here. Also requiring insurers to cover preventative care, such as routine mammograms, immunizations at no out-of-pocket cost, and preventing, again, insurers from using these lifetime and annual caps. So a lot of this big laundry list, I could go on for hours about the immediate benefits that we implemented. And then we also implemented all four of the major components of the Affordable Care Act that I outlined a moment ago, all four. So what have been the results of our collective efforts here in California to implement the Affordable Care Act? Well, it's been very successful. That's not to say that it's not been without its challenges. Uh, that's not to say that there haven't been bumps along the road. But I think, generally speaking, most observers believe that we've been successful in California in terms of implementation as far as it goes. So according to a recent Kaiser Family Health Foundation survey, just looking at the issue of the uninsured for a moment, 58% of those 6 million California adults who were previously uninsured report now that they are insured with the full implementation of the ACA in California. So 58% of the uninsured now insured. And according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, that translates into about 3.4 million of the 6 million adults previously uninsured now having insurance. That's a big deal. Of those who obtained coverage in 2014, when we did full implementation, the most common source of the new coverage uh, is Medi-Cal, about 25% of the previously uninsured that now are insured obtained their insurance through Medi-Cal. And California did enroll about 1.9 million new single adults in its Medi-Cal program, and that's a big deal. An additional 9% of California's previously uninsured say they enrolled in a plan through Covered California, our new health benefits exchange that I described a moment ago. 12% say they obtained coverage through an employer. 5% say they obtained coverage in the individual market outside of Covered California. Covered California is not the only place where individuals can go to get health insurance. There's a market outside Covered California as well. So Covered California reported that they signed up roughly 1.4 million Californians for individual market health insurance, and this includes people that had insurance before the ACA and people that had no health insurance before the ACA. But about 80% of the 1.4 million that signed up through Covered California are eligible for the premium subsidies that I described a moment ago, and they're taking advantage of them. So all of this is really good news. Um, that's not to say that we don't have a number of major challenges in implementation going forward. Uh, you've probably read about issues around the adequacy of medical provider networks. That's a big deal. Um, as well, we have issues making sure that we are reflecting the full diversity of California in the enrollment numbers. There have been issues about a disproportionate share of the uninsured being from minority groups and making sure that they are signed up in numbers commensurate with their portion of the overall population. We continue to have a huge problem with the opacity of medical care pricing. Some people have likened shopping for medical care to going into a department store, putting a bag over your head, picking things off the, off the shelves, putting them in your cart, checking out at the check-in line, still with a bag over your head, uh, having them run your credit card through, and then at the end, maybe when you get into the food court of the mall, you take the bag off and you see what you got, and maybe you know what it costs. Total opacity in pricing. We need to work on that. We are doing some things around that. I can talk about that later in greater detail if folks want to talk about that. But what I want to focus on right now is the big missing piece of the Affordable Care Act and health care reform, and that is the absence of any authority to reject excessive health insurance rate hikes. And while there are many positive elements of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm a big supporter of the Act. I ran on the Act in 2010. I promised California I would implement it. I've worked hard to implement it. I probably spent about 75 percent of my time as your commissioner working on implementing it. There is a big missing piece of the Affordable Care Act. Californians have suffered from repeated health insurance rate hikes year after year. On average, rates in the last 10 years for family insurance have gone up over 185 percent. 
And that's on average. Some people have had 300, 400% increases. Now, what's curious about that, 185% increase in rates on average for family insurance in California in the last 10 years, is that that's five times the general rate of inflation. Five times the general rate of inflation. And it's also much bigger than medical cost inflation. The actual cost of services provided by doctors and nurses and hospitals and medical providers, the year-to-year -year inflation rate is only about 3 or 4%. So you can see the huge gap between inflation rates for medical cost and where health insurance rates have been going. And that gap between those two trend lines is where the enormous profit taking occurs in the market. So the rate increases are simply unsustainable. And since taking office in 2011, um, I saw many health insurers implement multiple double digit increases. Despite my best efforts to call attention to these increases, despite our review of these rate increases, our calling attention to the fact that they were excessive and unreasonable, they would go ahead with the rate increases in most cases. Um, and for the period from 2011 to 2013, uh, we saw double digit rate increases from just about every carrier in the individual and small employer market. Now, moving into 2014, where we're implementing Covered California and all of the market reforms that I've described, a lot was said about the rates for 2014. Uh, there were observers who said that those rates were good rates. Um, and a lot of uh, information going out uh, to suggest that uh, something had changed somehow with regard to the rate increases. Now, what struck me about that, though, was that at the same period, in late 2013, early 2014, I and many other officials in the state were receiving thousands of phone calls and letters from irate consumers who were not experiencing good rates in 2014. What they were experiencing was continued dramatic double-digit rate increases. So there was this disconnect between what was being said publicly about how great the rates were versus what was happening to consumers as reflected to us in the complaints they made. So because the pronouncements that were being made about the 2014 rates were not in alignment with what we were hearing from consumers, I directed my department's actuaries to do a study and compare the 2014 individual market rates to the 2013 individual market rates. And what we found was very disturbing. Although many consumers had experienced double-digit rate increases in individual market health insurance products year after year prior to 2014, the rate increases many Californians received in 2014 were higher than in previous years. In fact, with variation for geography and age, the average rate increases for people who had health insurance in 2013 and who bought 2014 coverage were between 22 and 88 percent on average higher. This large average rate increase occurred even with the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act and covered California. Now, for those individuals who were buying in covered California, whose incomes were low enough to qualify for the subsidy, the effect of that rate increase was mass. They weren't paying that rate increase because there was a federal taxpayer-funded subsidy to subsidize their rate. But somebody was paying for it. Um, but for those folks who are outside of covered California, here it's important to note that while covered California has about 1.4 million lives, there's about five to six million people outside of covered California in the individual and small employer market, and they get no subsidy. They were experiencing a very real rate increase in 2014. <coughs> so for example, on April 1st, 2014, Anthem Blue Cross of California raised rates an average of 16.4% on 225,000 individual policyholders in California. And this was a total average increase of 37.55% over the prior 24 months for those policyholders. Now, my actuaries looked at this rate increase. We looked at it. We concluded it was not justified and that it was excessive. I called Anthem Blue Cross of California CEO, told them that our actuaries had determined the rate to be unreasonable, asked them to refrain from that level of rate increase, and they said, thank you very much, Commissioner, but we're going to go ahead and move forward with the rate increase. How can this be? Now, it surprises most Californians to learn that their insurance commissioner does not have the authority to reject excessive health insurance and HMO rate hikes. In fact, no one in California has that authority, nor does the federal government. So insurers are free to set the rates where they please, and they continue to do so. Now, what's particularly galling about this is 35 other states have given their insurance commissioner the authority to reject excessive health insurance and HMO rate increases, but not California. We've tried in California to pass this reform legislatively. Over the last seven years, four separate bills were introduced in the California legislature to accomplish this reform. All four were killed by the very powerful and wealthy and influential health insurance and HMO lobby. So it's not going to happen legislatively. Now, what's equally outrageous, though, 
is that from our own experience here in California, we know that regulation of insurance rate works. Under Proposition 103, which was enacted by the voters in 1988, the California Insurance Commissioner has the authority to reject excessive auto insurance rates, homeowner rates, and all property and casualty rates. And commissioners have done exactly that since 1988 and saved consumers over $100 billion. And yet all those insurance companies are still writing in California. You turn on your TV and you see the nice lady in white, and you see that skinny lizard, and you see the people at the college and the people with the nice hands, they're all here selling insurance and they're making money. Uh, but at the same time, we've used rate regulation under the authority of the insurance commissioner and with the professionals at the Department of Insurance to save consumers and businesses over $100 billion. Now, it's disturbing to me and should be disturbing to all of us that that authority does not extend to health insurance or HMO product. And what is particularly frustrating is that now the health insurers and HMOs have what's tantamount to a legal monopoly. Because under the Affordable Care Act, as I explained a moment ago, we have to buy their product. And to make matters worse, the individual, market in, uh, individual health insurance market in California is concentrated between just four health insurers. And they're HealthNet, Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Kaiser. Those four sold over 93% of the individual policies that were sold in Covered California in 2014. Four have 93% of the individual market in Covered California. Outside the market, they have about, outside of Covered California, they have about 80% of the individual market. So the concentration of these markets in the hands of just a few health insurers, those of you who are uh, students of economics and students of public policy know, can only lead to one thing in terms of pricing. These are classic price setters as opposed to price takers. It's not a purely competitive market. It's an oligopolistic or monopolistic market where the pricing behavior is such that they can charge rates as high as they want. Now let me share with you just one anecdote about what this means. This is the story of a gentleman named Scott who's age 62. So he's not eligible for Medicare yet. And I carry with me a letter he wrote uh, because it's so tremendously important. Now he has health insurance from Anthem Blue Cross in California. His health insurance five years ago was $563 a month. Now it's $1,574 a month, three times higher. Now in April of 2014, it went up 23.1%. This is after the opening of Covered California, after the implementation of the Federal Care Act that we've been working so hard on. He pays 37% more for his health insurance premiums than he does for his mortgage. With his high deductible co-payments and premiums, he spends more than $25,000 a year for health care. And this is after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Now, many national Democrats sought to put health insurance rate regulation into the Affordable Care Act. Dianne Feinstein was one of those leaders, other leaders, Democratic leaders in the House and Senate. But again, the health insurers and the HMOs blocked that reform from being included in the Affordable Care Act. This November, you, as the voters of California, will have a chance to accomplish this reform that has been long sought and denied to us by the health insurers and HMOs. There is a ballot measure on the ballot in November, Proposition 45, which if enacted by you, the voters, will give the insurance commissioner and California the same authority that 35 other states have to reject excessive health insurance and HMO rate hikes. Now, to get on the ballot, 850,000 voters had to sign a petition. And what a struggle that was. So let me just quickly step through what's in that proposition. It provides the same authority that 35 other states have to reject excessive health insurance and HMO rates. It's based on the successful model I described to you a moment ago, Proposition 103, which already gives insurance commissioners that authority for car insurance and for house insurance, for all these other insurance product lines, which has worked so successfully. Proposition 45 requires health insurers and HMOs to publicly justify their rates. They're required to file individual and small employer rates and to document the justification for any rate increases. Then the public is given the opportunity to review and comment on the rates, and the rates are subjected to the review of the actuarial professionals at the Department of Insurance, and when a rate is found to be excessive or unjustified, the rate is reduced. Now, despite claims to the contrary, Prop 45 was written with the Affordable Care Act in mind. The Affordable Care Act was enacted in 2009 at the federal level, and California law establishing covered California and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act was enacted in 2010. Prop 45 was written after that, taking all of the ACA into consideration. There's no conflict or inconsistency between Prop 45 and the Affordable Care Act or covered California. The Department of Insurance, which has over 25 years administering insurance rate regulation is the only agency in California with that experience, has reviewed Prop 45 and the Affordable Care Act and concluded that Prop 45 can be implemented without any conflict or delay for enrollment inside or outside of Cover California. And I, as a supporter of 
the Affordable Care Act and one charged with implementing it, and Dianne Feinstein and Barbara Boxer and a whole host of others who are responsible for getting the Affordable Care Act passed also support Prop 45 and know that there's no conflict. Now, like Prop 103, which is the one for car insurance and home insurance, Prop 45 allows the public to comment on or intervene in rate filings. What this means is that the department and the commissioner have to consider public input, and that's a good thing in determining whether a rate is excessive. And there's no conflict in allowing public input. In fact, the Affordable Care Act provides grant monies to states that have health insurance rate regulation so they can provide grant funds to public organizations to comment on the rates. So there's no conflict between Prop 45's public comment provision and the Affordable Care Act, which actually has money in it to pay for people to comment and participate in the rates. And again, we've looked at the timelines associated with Prop 45 as well as the timelines associated with Covered California and are confident we can accomplish these two things, including intervention by the public, public hearings, uh, whatever is necessary to make sure we get that public input. And we know this is the case too because despite our correct view that we are exceptional as Californians, it is the case that there are 49 other states and 35 of them have adopted health insurance rate regulation and by the way, they're implementing the Affordable Care Act. And they're doing it without any inconsistency in these 35 other states. They have exchanges, or they're on the federal exchange, and there's been no conflict between the two. And we even had a trial run in 2013. My department gets rate filings. We just don't get the ability to make our determination about them binding. So in 2013, we got rate filings. We reviewed them. Our sister agency, Department of Managed Health Care, reviewed them. We reviewed them in time. We got public comment. Got them done in time for Covered California to have those rates on the exchange with no delays. So we know that we can accomplish this process without any negative impact. Conversely, those states that have health insurance rate regulation in the hands of the commissioner are getting better rates than their exchanges alone. So I think you probably have all seen at least one of the TV ads that are being run against Prop 45. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands. Uh, but uh, the health insurers have put $37 million into an opposition campaign account to oppose Proposition 45. And they're running ads on radio and TV up and down the state. And one of the things in the ad they say is that there's an independent commission which already regulates health insurance rates and Prop 45 is unnecessary. Well, that is simply not true. First, it should be telling that they don't tell you who the independent commission is. There's just an independent commission. Well, there isn't an independent commission that regulates rates. It doesn't exist in California. If they're talking about Covered California, though, that's also deceptive and misleading because Covered California doesn't regulate rates. It's a marketplace through which health insurance is sold. Now, it was hoped, theoretically, that Covered California would have the bargaining power to negotiate better rates in that marketplace. But our experience has been, unfortunately, to the contrary. Why? Well, as I shared with you earlier, one of the prime objectives of Covered California is to get as many people insured as possible. And if that's your objective, you can't afford to throw a health insurer HMO out if they have an excessive rate. You need everybody in the market to make sure that everyone gets covered. But the situation is even worse than that. Originally, there were going to be 13 health insurers in Covered California. Well, we ended up with 11 in 2014, and now it's dropped down to 10. So the number of health insurers is actually going down. Again, you don't have the ability to throw people out when you need everybody in. But even beyond that, it's important to understand that those 10 health insurers that are selling through Covered California, only four are even close to being statewide. That's Anthem, Blue Shield, Kaiser, and HealthNet. And even those four aren't in every place in the state. In fact, there are some places in California where you can only find one health insurer selling a covered California product. So again, when you have that kind of accessibility, you can't afford to throw anybody out. Because if you throw someone out, you may be creating a huge coverage gap. Uh, but in addition to that uh, is the issue I raised a moment ago, which is those four that are even close to being statewide are responsible for 93% of the policies sold in covered California. So you certainly can't throw one of them out if they have an excessive rate. So we saw firsthand the inability to negotiate better rates when we compared the 2013 rates to the 2014 rates in Covered California and outside Covered California. And again, what I shared with you earlier was our actuaries did an independent analysis, looked at the rates in 2013, looked at the rates in 2014, and found that there was a 22 to 88 percent increase on average across California, even with Covered California. And so all of this evidence supports what I'm saying to you, but it's also been the experience in other states as well. 
Um, their exchanges have not been able to get better rates without an insurance commissioner. In those states that have an insurance commissioner with this authority, they've been able to get better rates. I'll give you one last piece of evidence, because I'm a lawyer, and I like to make my case. So we actually had an opportunity to throw a health insurer out of covered California. Uh, in 2013, uh, my department discovered that Anthem Blue Cross of California was including in its rates for small employers a charge for the Federal Affordable Care Act tax that Anthem didn't have to pay until 18 months later. So they were collecting from small businesses in California a tax that they didn't have to pay for 18 months. Now that's great for them. They can invest that money, earn a return on it, make whatever money they want on, on, on the small business money, and then pay the tax. But we believe that to be unreasonable and excessive. And so we made a finding, and the Affordable Care Act provides language that gives the insurance commissioner the authority to recommend to the state exchange, Covered California, when a health insurer should be removed from the exchange because of an excessive rate. Now, mind you, I'm talking about a small employer rate. So we're talking about the portion of the exchange that dealt with small employers, which is what's called the shop exchange, which, frankly, Covered California did not put a lot of resources into, and I understand the big the big moment was trying to get as many individuals sign up as possible, and rightly so. And so there were only a few thousand policies sold in the small employer exchange. So removing Anthem from that exchange would have had hardly no effect in real terms, and they could still sell outside the exchange where the vast majority of small employers buy their health insurance anyways. I recommended to cover California that they exclude Anthem Blue Cross from the small employer exchange because they were collecting a tax 18 months in advance of when they should pay it. You could find no clear case of an excessive rate, and yet Covered California could not bring themselves to barring Anthem Blue Cross from just the tiny, 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 tiny small employer exchange. So I'm not saying this in any, in any negative way. I fully support Covered California. I've worked very, very hard with them to get that implemented. It's a very positive thing. But I'm just pointing out to you that this theory about the ability to negotiate better rates has turned out to be a theory and not the reality. Now, the other thing I think it's important uh, to note um, is that this is not a unique experience, as I pointed out a moment ago. Other states have had the same issue. Uh, they've gotten better rates when their insurance commissioner has had this authority. What's happened for 2015 rates? Well, it is true that the health insurers have filed far more modest increases for 2015. But why is that? Well, Proposition 45 is on the ballot in November. The last thing the health insurers want is a repeat of what happened in 2009 when Anthem Blue Cross raised rates on average 39% in California, created a huge national outcry, which drove the Affordable Care Act across the finish line in Congress. So of course, the health insurers for 2015 have filed modest rate increases because they don't want to stir things up. But if Prop 45 does not pass in November, we will go back to double-digit rate increases. It's simply economics. It's simply economics. Now, the other thing that you'll, you'll see in this uh, ad is uh, that uh, there's some sort of a power grab being alleged. Uh, of course, the, the truth uh, that's omitted from the health insurer's advertising and commercials uh, is that the insurance commissioner already has the authority to regulate insurance rates for just about every other cotton-picking form of insurance, just not health insurance, and that 35 other states have this authority as well. So it's awfully hard to imagine anyone believing that that would be a power grab. But the health insurers are also trying to scare supporters of the Affordable Care Act into thinking that Prop 45 will allow a future commissioner or member of the public to gum up the works for the Affordable Care Act. That also is not true. Just as there's no independent commission that regulates rates, just as there's no power grab, it's also simply not the case that this will gum up the works. Now, the insurance commissioner, whether it's me or somebody else, is required by law to faithfully execute and implement the laws of the state of California. And this includes California laws implementing the Affordable Care Act and covered California. The commissioner is required by law to implement the Affordable Care Act, and nothing in Proposition 45 changes that. And when Prop 45 passes, commissioners will be required to implement it consistent with the Affordable Care Act, regardless of whether they're Democrats, Republicans, independents, or pick some other party. We're a nation of laws. We enact reforms into law to make sure that whoever is the future office holder will follow the law. 
Can you imagine not enacting the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act or even the Affordable Care Act because we were afraid, gee, someone might be elected president who doesn't like those things? No, we put these things in law because they're important reforms and we expect the office, office holders to enact them. So of course not. It's simply nonsense to argue that we should be fearful of the fact that there might be some different insurance commissioner. That's why Proposition 45 is a law. It puts the standard in the law. Now, I support this because, like many Californians, I am deeply frustrated about the rate increases we see and will continue to see. I support the Affordable Care Act, but this is a missing piece of it. And I worry, as a supporter of the Affordable Care Act, that without this piece, public support for the Affordable Care Act could erode. It is certainly wonderful that those whose incomes are low enough are able to qualify for Medi-Cal or get a premium subsidy in exchange. But for many Californians, and for California small businesses, you don't get a premium subsidy. And what you're getting is a rate increase. And if we're not careful, if we don't deliver on the promise of affordability, we could see public support for this tremendously important reform erode. So you will have a chance to decide this. Um, I've told you my views. I strongly support Proposition 45. I believe the time is now. And I will tell you one final thing. If it does not pass now, it will never pass. It has taken us 10 years, literally, to get to this place. And there's no question that there is a serious mismatch between the $37 million the health insurers have to attack it and the um, small amount of funding that the consumer groups have been able to collect in support of it. But there is um, a limited amount of energy and effort that consumer groups have. This is our moment to pass this. That's why the health insurers are fighting so hard against it. So I appreciate your kind time and attention. We can stop talking about insurance if you like and talk about anything else in the world, uh, or I'm happy to delve even deeper into insurance. Thanks so very, very much. Thank you. So let's go over here. Commissioner threw his speech on the floor when he was finished. So he's I think those up. were your remarks, actually, Dean. Oh, are those my remarks you threw on the floor? Yeah. Okay. But I appreciate you picking stuff up. Thank you. Um, so the first thing to say is I, I have been informed Brandon Crawford Giants hit a grand slam. And what is the, what's the score right now? Do we know? Four nothing. So the Giants are ahead. And what inning are we in? The sixth inning. Okay. It's not over, but, you know, that's, that's good news. So good. Uh, and that was a grand slam, too. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I do in my He's classes, very good. one of the things I do in my classes is I play Milton Friedman. It's one of the most fun things I do because it's fun to be Milton Friedman. The world is very simple and straightforward. Uh, Milton Friedman would say, and in fact, actually, modern antitrust theory would say, look, doesn't force, force a lot of play, uh, organizations to have with 80% of the market. Uh, in fact, uh, by and large, cases against play, uh, organizations like Microsoft have eventually been dropped, even though they dominated most of the market. The real issue is whether there's a threat of entry and the possibility other places, uh, other firms could come in and take part of the market. And so, and why isn't four enough? And why aren't they competing on price? So, what's going on here? Great question. Well, um, those of you who are or have studied economics um, know that there are certain markets where there are essential goods and services being provided and where there are significant economies of scale and where there's the ability of the provider of that good or service, service to monopolize the market. And I think the difference between the Microsoft example or any of these other tech examples is that health insurance is an essential good. We desperately need it. And we're going to pay just about anything to get it. So having a, a monopoly in some of these other markets isn't the end of the world. But having a monopoly in this market means you can go without. But is for so, a monopoly? Oh, I, it's an oligopoly, um, more precisely. Uh, but it's the same pricing behavior. Look, you're, you're never going to have a, computer, a purely competitive market in this space because there are natural barriers to entry. You've got to be huge to do this. You've got to have huge infrastructure. You have to have huge IT. And you have to have a heck of a lot of capital to pay claims. So the 50 of us can't just go out tomorrow, dig uh, uh, whatever's in our pocket, and form an insurance company. So it's a, it's a naturally oligo... I can say it, I'm sure. Oligopolistic. Thank you, market. Thank you, Milton. <laughs> um, but, but in those markets, you don't have sufficient competition for the actors to be competing uh, in any real way on price. And so they have the ability to be price setters, not price takers, and that's the phenomenon. And who knows whether we'll always have for it. 
may go down, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the simple reality is that the pricing that we're seeing in California um, is driven by this market dynamic. Um, I'm not casting a moral judgment on it, uh, but it's not going to change. And, and let, let's think about other goods or services where there's a single provider of a good or service that's an essential good or service. Water, electricity, natural gas. In all these cases, we don't allow the providers of those goods and services just to set the price wherever they will. We decide we're going to regulate the price. Now, it's not price control. It's not price fixing. You do an individual determination of the carrier, of the product, of the price of the product, of their return, of their administrative costs, of their claims experience, of their utilization, the whole thing. Um, but we have done it very successfully for all these other insurance product lines uh, without there being any injury to the economy. You know, the big uh, fear in 1988 that the insurers tried to put out was, oh gosh, you know, the insurance market will collapse if Prop 103 passes. If we have rate regulation of auto insurance and home insurance and all these other insurance products. Guess what? Didn't happen. Uh, they're making decent money, but at the same time, we're saving consumers a lot of money. So you started to answer what the second line of defense typically is for Milton Friedman, which is, well, maybe there's a problem. I'm not sure, but maybe. But how do we know the government won't mess it up? And in fact, the ads are, of course, going at that quite fiercely with, should we just give one man, that's you, I think, uh, all the power to regulate these markets? Well, what I can say to that is simply this. 35 other states have done it and it's worked very well. It hasn't been abused. It's saving money. We've done it for just about every other aspect of the insurance market, and it's worked very well, and it's saved consumers and businesses $100 billion. Um, so we have evidence before us with regard to other states doing this reform for health insurance and HMO product, with regard to our own state doing it uh, in the area of uh, insurance. And so I, I look at the evidence, and, and it's worked out. It hasn't been abused, and there are safeguards. We put it into the law to make sure that the power is checked, uh, to make sure it's not unfettered discretion. There's a standard that has to be adhered to. All of these things that we do when we enact new laws to make sure that something isn't abused. But all I can do is, is point to how well it has worked elsewhere and point to what's happening with the absence of it here in California where we keep getting hit, hit with these rate increases year after year. Okay, so Milton Friedman's final line of defense is this, which is, okay, maybe there's a problem, and maybe in some technical way government could actually make it better, but look at situations where government has tried to regulate industries and we've had capture by those industries. And there are some, for example, who think the PUC in the state of California has been at least to some degree captured by PG&E, why wouldn't your agency get captured as well? Well, th this goes uh, back to the unique aspect of the insurance commissioner's office, which is it's directly elected by you. So you get to decide who that person's going to be, and if they're captured, you can toss them out. Very different from the PUC, which is appointed, or frankly, Covered California, which is appointed also. One of the other deceptions and uh, uh, distortions in these ads is not only are they not telling you who this independent commission is, and there isn't an independent commission that can regulate rates, one doesn't exist, but if they're referring to Covered California, as I pointed out a moment ago, it doesn't have that authority. But also, it's appointed by politicians who take money from the insurance industry. Um, and so, you know, to suggest that that's independence, I mean, I think at the end of the day, to this question about whether there will be abuse, the, and whether it's too much power, the answer is, look, 35 other states have done it without abuse. California has done it without abuse for insurance products. There are all sorts of protections built into it. But at the end of the day, you get to decide who holds the office, and you get to throw out a person if, in fact, they're captured. And I think that's a very, very unique thing and what makes this office particularly unique in this regard. So why don't the nurses and some of the other organized interest groups support Prop 45? Why do we find some of the interest groups who you might think would be supporting it, not supporting it in the healthcare field? Well, there's another deception about those ads. They have a nurse there, but in fact, the California Nurses Association, which represents the working men and women in the nursing profession, supports Prop 45. Um, and so there are a lot of distortions and mistruths that you're going to see on the TV um, in these ads, but the Nurses Association supports Prop 45. Um, so, I've got some questions here which are technical things, which to be honest, I'm not sure I quite understand. Maybe I should just hand them to you and see if you can, can decipher them. But there's obviously 
seriously technical, confusing kinds of things with various groups. And so you say there is no commission, yet I have one person who says there is an organization that does uh, regulate some of the rates, um, and I'm not sure what that organization is. But so not for health insurance. I mean, what, what this question might be referring to is Covered California. Covered California does not regulate rates. Um, the theory was it could negotiate better rates. As I explained in some detail, that theory was not borne out in practice. Um, it's uh, an appointed body. It's not directly accountable to you. Um, and so for all those reasons, if that's what the health insurers are referring to in their ads, although, again, they don't say, you know, uh, which ought to be telling in and of itself that they're not identifying who this independent commission is, but it doesn't have that authority. So let's back up. At the beginning, you were talking about the Affordable Care Act and the implementation in California. Uh, if it's been so good, why has public support not grown? In fact, according to this card, it has actually dropped in terms of public opinion. I think it has to do with the rates. I mean, remember, it's the Affordable Care Act, right? Well, what we've done a good job at is getting more people covered, and that's a great thing. And I don't, I don't in any way want to diminish that. And if that's all we did, that would be worth doing. But, but it is the Affordable Care Act, and the promise was that there would also be affordability. Now, if you make a low income, you're getting affordability. I mean, we've, we've signed up 1.9 million single poor adults for Medi-Cal. That's fantastic. If you make a low enough income, you get a subsidized premium. Although, we all have to pay for that. That's being paid for by federal taxpayers. And so the rate increases that I've described to you are masked for those that are receiving the subsidy in covered California, but someone's paying for it. But if you're not eligible for the subsidy, you're getting a rate increase. If you're a small business owner and you're trying to find health insurance for your people, you're getting a rate increase. It's as simple as that. And while it's a great thing that 1.4 million people are signed up in covered California, some portion of whom didn't have health insurance before, some who did, some are getting the subsidy, there are five to six million people outside of covered California who are in the individual or small employer market and they're getting a rate increase. And guess what? they answer public opinion surveys. And I think that helps explain why support is ebbing. And that is exactly the point I made a moment ago, which is if we don't pass Prop 45, we could find ourselves in a position where public support could erode entirely for the Affordable Care Act because it's not providing the requisite level of affordability to everyone. And that's a big problem. As a Democrat, as someone who supports this, that's a big problem. So I can say that as someone who watches TV and actually tries to follow various things, it was confusing at first to sort out ads about 45 and 46 to figure out what was going on and which was which and so forth. You've helped me to figure out what 45 is about. But 46 has to do with doctors and it also raises caps on non-economic damages in certain kinds of legal suits as I understand it according to this card. Um, how should I feel about 46? And is that another tool that we could use to try to affect rates, or is that just a completely different issue? It's a completely different issue. Um, what Prop 46 is designed to do is to deal with a cap that was imposed by the legislature in 1974 on what are called non-economic damages. Stop me if you're getting bored. <laughs> um, so non-economic damages are the damages that um, uh, a, a tortfeasor is required to pay um, to capture the non-economic uh, nature of the injury. So economic damages are, you know, what's your future uh, earnings uh, stream over the next number of years? But for people that are seniors or for people who um, have had low levels of, of employment, you're not going to get much recovery in, in economic damages. So why was the cap put in place? The cap was put in place because uh, physicians were very, very concerned about the price of medical malpractice insurance. And by capping non-economic damages, uh, the thought was that that would help constrain the price of medical malpractice insurance. Well, here's an interesting thing that I discovered when I got into office in, in, in 2011. I suspected that the medical malpractice insurers were actually charging excessive rates even with this cap that I described. So I ordered them to file the rates. And oddly enough, I have the authority to regulate medical malpractice insurance rates, <laughs> just not health insurance for all of you. Um, because medical malpractice insurance, by definition, is a casualty insurance. So I ordered the medical malpractice insurers under my jurisdiction to file the rates, and lo and behold, discovered their loss ratios. The, the portion of every buck they were collecting from physicians were really low, somewhere in the area of 50 or 60 percent. In other words, for every buck they were collecting from a physician who was paying for medical malpractice insurance from them, they're only paying out 50 or 60 cents in claims. So I reduced their rates um, and saved physicians $56 million annually 
uh, by reducing the medical malpractice insurer's rates. Now, gosh, I wish I could do that for ordinary health insurance. I really do. But what that showed, showed me also is that the, the, the cap is not uh, having the desired effect necessarily with regard to constraining excessive rate setting in medical malpractice rates. So you know, I think if, if Prop 46 passes, and I support Prop 46, uh, you're not going to see some huge uptick uh, in medical malpractice insurance rates. The commissioner will be able to use his or her authority to constrain that. There'll be some increase. But the policy question for everybody is, is weighing that versus the ability of people to, to recover something if they're, if they're injured. And there's a huge divide over that issue with the medical community on one side, consumer groups and attorneys on the other, uh, and it's a battle royale. So I was astonished to find, I'm pleased to find out that a fair number of people now have signed up and are now covered, but it still seems like a lot of people aren't covered. Is there maybe a trade-off between trying to regulate healthcare costs and, prov and maybe possibly reducing uh, the provision of health care in some areas where hospitals maybe have to close down. Somebody here in a card gives an example of the doctor's medical center is shutting down even with $3 million appropriation that was provided by the, the legislature. And perhaps they're shutting down because they can't afford to keep going given the amount of money they have coming in. So if we're trying to regulate rates, are we reducing the provision of health care, especially in some areas? And therefore, how are we going to meet the goal of the Affordable Care Act to actually provide health care to everybody? Fair enough. So Proposition 45 requires the commissioner to make sure that the rate is not excessive, but also to make sure the rate's not inadequate. And an inadequate rate is spelled out in regulation in a body of law under Prop 103. But in the health insurance context, an inadequate rate means a rate that's too low to cover medical costs. So the commissioner and the Department of Insurance have to take as a starting place whatever the health insurers and HMOs have to pay for medical costs. You have to start there. So there's not an ability to set the rates so low that we're going to deprive medical providers of whatever their contracted rates. Now, the, 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 the question arises, are they, are they being compensated adequately? But Prop 45 does not allow the commissioner to regulate the actual rate between the medical provider and the health insurer HMO. But it, it, you take that, that reimbursement, that medical cost is a given. What Prop 45 does is focus on the excess profit taking, the health insurers, the administrative costs, the inflated uh, estimates of, of utilization, inflated estimates of cost. To the question of what's happening generally in the healthcare market, well, it's a, it's a multivariate uh, public policy analytical problem um, because it really varies based on what sort of medical provider are you are, where you are in the market, what kind of market power you have. Um, there are some hospitals who have principally been providing treatment for poor people uh, and have huge shares of their patient mix who are on Medi-Cal. The Medi-Cal reimbursement rates in this state are abysmal. They do not adequately compensate any medical provider for the work that he or she is doing, and they need to be raised. Um, and I have argued that to the legislature and to the governor whose province it is to make that decision. They're too low. But what, what, what has happened then is that those, some hospitals that have high cohorts of, of folks who are on Medi-Cal aren't getting enough money, and so they're having, to, they're having to close their doors or they're being sold off to other hospitals. Now, conversely, um, there are hospitals who are in excellent economic condition in a given regional market. Um, for example, this may surprise you, maybe not, but there's actually uh, upwards to a 50% delta in hospital pricing for procedures in Northern California versus procedures in Southern California. And that has to do with market share and market dominance in Northern California versus Southern California. So it, it really sort of depends. And there's a whole amount of merger and acquisition that's going on in the health space where hospitals are buying up physician groups, they're buying up ambulatory surgical centers. There's a whole consolidation going on, which may be good from the standpoint of coordinating care, but may be really bad from the standpoint of monopoly pricing. So all that's to say that, that, that Prop 45 um, doesn't intrude upon what's happening with regard to those underlying dynamics. What it's really designed to do is to go after the health insurers and HMOs, excess profit taking, 
and administrative costs, but there is a tremendous amount of shakeout that's going on in the healthcare industry generally. That is worrisome to me. As, as, as a statewide official, um, I am very concerned about some of the degree of consolidation I see, and I'm very concerned, as I alluded to a moment ago, about the total opacity in pricing. You can't find out what things cost to save your life. Um, it's totally opaque. Now, I have applied for and gotten a grant from federal HHS to try to set up a data center whose vision is to provide real-time price information and quality information to consumers before they make decisions about where to have a lab test done or where to have a procedure done. My staff all encouraged me not to apply for this grant. They said, there's no way we're going to succeed at this. Uh, but I'm a big believer in failing boldly, if we're going to fail. <laughs> Uh, and so we're going to try to do it. But it's really hard because it turns out that the holders of all this data, the health insurers, the HMOs, the hospital systems, physician groups, you name it, they really don't want to give up data about pricing. And so we're going to try to get them all together and have a conversation about the importance of this. The legislature is beginning to, to show a, a lot of interest in this as well. And we're hoping through a collaborative effort we can provide more information. You may have seen that the local national public radio station has started a crowdsourcing uh, uh, feature of this, where they're encouraging folks to uh, submit uh, their bills, their medical provider bills, and they're trying to create a database of that. So we'll have a crowdsourcing element in what we're trying to create as well. Um, I want to underscore, we're not going to build this data center at the Department of Insurance. If I've learned anything in government, it's we really do IT poorly. <laughs> Don't do IT. So we're actually um, in, a, in a, uh, a partnership with an academic institution to help us put this together. Who is that academic institution? Well, you know, I, I should have stopped. Is it, I is should it, have stopped. It's Tom McCurdy at Stanford, have, maybe. I, no, no, no. But I should have stopped. Uh, it, it is a UC. It's just UCSF. UCSF. Uh, oh, OK. That's yeah. good. I, I should have stopped while I was ahead. I should have it's stopped. better than Stanford. I, did I tell you Stanford. my wife is a graduate of Cal? OK. <laughs> did I mention that? OK, good. I will say there's a lot of questions about concern about access and about examples people give about having their insurance rates go up and the difficulties that's causing them and, and a real concern that what will Prop 45 or just will, what in general will folks in the state government do to try to make sure in fact that access uh, remains available and that we do reduce the degree to which uh, people can't find places to sign up and, uh, and can't seem to get insurance. Well. We're going to continue um, working really, really hard to expand enrollment uh, in 2015. And that means uh, doing a better job also of enrolling um, certain uh, uh, ethnic uh, minorities in California, um, and also doing a better job of trying to get to uh, more difficult to reach places in California. But I think the start has been very good. I mean, l l let's face it, uh, you know, 1.4 million people, it's a huge enterprise. Um, and I think it's been, the enrollment piece has been very, very positive. Uh, but we need to continue to redouble our efforts. The, the pricing piece, though, is, is going to be a big, big problem if Prop 45 is, is not passed. There's no, someone asked me the other day, well, OK, so what if it doesn't pass? What's plan B? There's no plan B. There's no, the authority doesn't exist. We're going to see the rates go up and up and up. And we're not going to get the legislature to enact it. We've tried that at least four separate bills over seven years, and the health insurers have killed all those bills. There is just simply not the uh, capacity to try to put something like this on the ballot again. So if this doesn't pass, you know, we're going to see rates go up. But with $37 million being put forth by the health care organizations to try to defeat it, uh, and you said there wasn't that much money on the other side, what really is the strategy? Is there a final two-week blitz? Is there some strategy people have in mind for trying to get the word out? Well, the good news is we're still polling about 10 points ahead. Um, and the undecideds are down to about 14%. So even if the undecideds break 4 to 1 against, we should still prevail. And we're about the same place where Prop 103 was in 1988, uh, which is um, you know tens of millions of dollars of insurance spending uh, was deployed in deceptive advertising across the state to try to crush Prop 103. But the voters saw through it. They, they realized who was behind those ads. Now, I recognize it's hard to do with these ads because you'll notice the font is really difficult to read. Somehow they, they got the stuff about the power grab in a font you can read, you know, but the stuff about who's paying for it, which health insurers pay for it, really tough to read. But if you freeze the frame, you can see it. Um, so there will be some advertising on the Yes on 45 side that will go up next week. There'll be some advertising that will go up closer to the election. But 
uh, it's really, really hard because we're going to be outspent 30 to 1. At the end of the day, there is a tremendous grassroots effort that is underway. Um, individuals are taking it upon themselves to send emails to family, to friends, to neighbors, to coworkers. If you'd like to do that, go to Justify Rates. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> JustifyRates.com, and we can send you uh, the information. Um, and uh, we're encouraging people to take responsibility initiative to let others know about it. And uh, given the uh, tremendous uh, wealth and power on the other side, I think that's what we're going to do. And it worked in 1988, and I'm confident it'll work here. Great. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Dave Jones. Thanks a lot. So this will appear on UCTV, Public Policy Channel. I think it's a worthy addition. We do have somebody who really does talk po public policy. We appreciate that. That's wonderful. And thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for coming to this event. Thank you. Thank you.